Tom. I don't, oh, there's Jen, okay. All right. We are live on YouTube, so let's go ahead and reconvene the public session. Uh, for our board meeting tonight, we do have several meaty topics on our agenda tonight. Uh, first, we're going to um, hear from Mara on how the students are progressing during the pandemic. Um, she'll share with us the assessment results and, and her insights into what she is seeing based upon her experience and how our students are doing during this very unusual time and whether or not we need to do any course correction. So I'm very, very excited to hear that presentation. Um, Rachel will also be asking us to approve the resignation for the purpose of retirement for nine teachers, I believe. Um, those individuals have brought their passion to learning to the school for on average over 20 years per, for each uh, teacher. So um, I would like on behalf of the board to thank them very deeply for their gifted knowledge that they have given to so many students throughout those years. Um, and we wish them the best in this new in endeavor of them. And they will, uh, if my experience is any indication, they're going to understand the real meaning of the word freedom. So we're, wish them the best of luck. We're also going to consider a resolution to approve certain high-risk sports at the high school and uh, hear about the guidelines that we'll be following to avoid spreading of the coronavirus. Um, and last but not least, Dan is going to be presenting us uh, the update on our 21-22 district budgeting process. Um, budgets, of course, are kind of a reflection of the action that we take, uh, the actions we take at the board, and then, of course, the actions that the administrators take every single day. Um, the good news is our, our uh, district is in strong financial health, but we must remain diligent to keep it that way. Um, I was thinking about this this morning in preparation for this meeting, and there is so many things that the administration and the board actually doesn't have control over, but yet we have to manage. Um, and that's why we're blessed with the administration that we have. Um, and I just want to make sure that we all understand and the um, community understands that this long-term planning is very, very important to us because of these factors that we cannot control, but yet we're required to manage. We will hold our second workshop on March 6th relating to the budget um, and a, are expect, expecting to have a balanced budget at that time. And we will continue to share more information with the community um, in March and also as we go into April where we actually approve the budget. So it's a, a, a jammed packet evening. And before we get to Roy, um, I would like to call for a motion to approve the draft minutes of the meeting on from January 21st. So moved. Do I have a motion? Second? Tom and Jack. All right. Tom and Jack, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Connie, motion carries. Roy, over to you. Great, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, just very some quick updates, and then we'll get into the other parts of the agenda that Arlene mentioned. Um, just a quick status report on our COVID situation at the school. Um, as you saw from last Friday's letter, we uh, our number of cases, positive cases, went down significantly, with only one reported last week uh, that we learned. Um, <clears throat> this week, um, we have two new cases, from my understanding, that have been reported to us, one at the elementary level, one at the high school level. Um, so that's, you know, while that's never good to have new cases, it's still relatively low in comparison to where we were just a few weeks ago. And it's my understanding, even in town, that the number of active cases have gone down significantly. So that's, that's really positive. The, uh, the new quarantine uh, rules or guidance uh, are put in place and it, it uh, helps out quite a bit because we didn't have to quarantine as many people through these new uh, cases as we would have in the past. So that's been uh, also helpful from a quarantining perspective. Uh, I read with interest today, the CDC may be recommending or has recommended that anyone who's been vaccinated will no longer have to be quarantined if they get exposed either. Uh, so we'll wait for New York. New York, I don't think New York has adopted that yet, but we'll wait for that to come out. That might be another positive step. And then um, when we look at the number of people who have to quarantine uh, due to exposure. Um, I would just like to remind everybody um, with the holiday, uh, holiday week or winter break coming up, um, we know there might be a number of people traveling. 
um, that you respect and adhere to the New York State travel restrictions and travel guidelines. So if you are going outside the contiguous states area that um, you quarantine appropriately. And as I've mentioned, I know at each of the council meetings that if uh, you're, you or your child are traveling and or you need remote instruction when you get back, please let the principals know and that can be arranged. Um, we want to make sure everybody stays safe. So please uh, go enjoy yourself wherever it is, but make sure you quarantine appropriately when you get back. Um, so we have that. Um, and also let the, the board and public know that we are currently working on a plan to try to um, get high school students back in uh, full time to get rid of our two thirds schedule. Uh, we're hoping that coincides with, um, with some more spaces coming online from the capital project uh, that, are, that are happening. So we expect by mid-March, I think, or we may have a plan in place to have whoever wants to come in full time at the high school that will be able to do so. So that would be uh, everybody K-12 uh, would be uh, provided the opportunity to come back full time, which I just think is wonderful uh, for our community, our kids, especially, and our teachers. I know it's very challenging for the teachers to have to teach um, you know, in a remote environment, a hybrid environment, and particularly at the high school and you have two thirds, three groups coming in each day. I know Ann does a great job of uh, reminding everybody, okay, A is in full day, B and C are in half days and every day it rotates and uh, I don't know how she keeps track of it, but uh, I'm glad she does. Um, so again, uh, by mid-March, I'm, I'm hoping that we can invite uh, high school students back in full time um, and just very quickly, we, we that it is because we'll have some additional spaces. The guidance suite should be open by then, which allows us to turn the old guidance office back to a classroom. And there's another classroom on the uh, third floor that we can get back as well. Uh, so it provides more spaces. We've moved some things around and the learning commons can actually be used the way we intended it to be used for larger groups at times, smaller groups when we need to, et cetera. So, those are all positive steps as we get through this uh, pandemic together. Um, so that's the, the quick, uh, quick update that I have. I'd like to go on to item B next, which is the uh, high risk sports resolution. I know the board has it in front of them, it's on the agenda. And prior to asking you to uh, approve the resolution, um, Joe, would you mind just reviewing a little bit about some of the high risk sports guidance that you received from the section and state? What's what we're putting in place, please? Good evening, everyone. So we have re received a bunch of guidance from our state and from the local DOH. Um, they've been combined together. Our section has approved it. So a couple of things that are of note. Um, high risk sports are the basically the indoor sports and then football and lacrosse. Uh, so that's the hockey and basketball. And then uh, gir girl swim is not high risk, but that was also approved. We just changed the date on that. Um, so basically we need, with the approval from the DOH, a different kind of um, stipulation was obviously that our children, um, conference three, our rule is children will play with masks on all sports. Um, some sections have, a, have it a little bit more lenient. It says if the kids can't tolerate it, they could drop their mask. In the fall, Conference 3, which is our conference, we determined in the fall that in order to participate in any of our contests, you have to wear your mask at all time. If you're having trouble, you, you take a knee or you move off the field. Um, so that's one thing that we're, we're doing to be a little bit more stringent than other sections are. Um, with football, um, which is a high-risk sport, we will have plastic shields on the helmets and the children will still wear uh, the traditional masks, so they'll be doubly protected for football. Um, and we're probably going to do the exact same thing for lacrosse also. Um, we're just waiting to see what the manufacturers come out with for the um, lacrosse helmets. Hockey is doing that also, face shields and a mask. Um, our coaches were outstanding during the fall season, making sure our children did it. We had a little bit of a mishap after the boys won the soccer championship. They tend to take the mask down for their pitchers, but we had them put the mask back up. Um, but in their, the excitement of winning it all, they took their mask down. But I will say this, it is not um, one thing that parents need to understand when they're watching the games on local live. It's not the officials to enforce that. It's up to school personnel, coaches and administration to enforce that during games. That's not the job of the officials. 
Um, so if, it, if it's happening during a game, um, that's up to us as administrators and the school uh, officials to make sure our children are, are wearing the masks. And like I said, most of the teams we play against are in conference three and the conference three rule is wear your mask at all times. Social distance is very important uh, for, the, for our indoor sports here, basketball and hockey. Um, you'll notice that um, no spectators are allowed. Um, the only guidance we received that we are, was favorable for parents is on senior nights, each senior can, well, each student can have two parents attend senior night. Um, we've elect, our league has elected that, um, they left it up to the league to say if each school can determine if parents can stay for the whole game or just for the senior night activity. At this point, we'd like to have our parents stay for the whole game because it is the one game they'll see uh, throughout the, the fall, or the, excuse me, the winter season. You'll also notice that for basketball, if you're, if you're used to coming to our games, children will not be seated in traditional seats. They will be seated on the bleachers and we have markers on the bleachers that are six feet apart. So we'll keep our kids socially distanced. Coaches will have um, two chairs where traditionally the benches are. They will sit there. Um, and actually you'll also notice too at our home games that no no lockers will be used. Students can use the restroom if they need it. They need to come dressed. Our team at halftime will go out into the far hallway uh, by the cafeteria. The visiting team will stay right in the lot. Well, stay, excuse me, will stay right in the gymnasium. There'll be no separating um, and going to locker rooms at halftime. Um, balls will be wiped down at halftime. Officials will be having two game balls in case one needs to be uh, wiped down. Um, so that that's particular for basketball, hockey. We're separating the benches. Some kids will have to stand behind the bench or stand next to the bench outside the glass if they can't have the exact um, opportunity to all stand a bench together. And as you can imagine, you know, a lot of the um, ice arenas have been built a long time ago, so the bench areas are small. So we will separate children that way. One thing that's very important to understand, high-risk sports that we take in place, if one child on the team gets COVID, the team shut down automatically for 10 days. There's no contact tracing on the team. The coach and the athletes on the team are automatically all shut down uh, for 10 days because they figured in an indoor sport such as basketball, it's too hard to determine who was next to who, whom for how long. So that's automatic 10 day shutdown of any child who is participating in basketball um, or hockey. And that's just, we're gonna miss it. Now all that's very interesting is we basically have 17 days to play games. So as you can imagine if a team, one kid gets on a team, you're basically, your season's basically over. Um, we are planning right now, just so you know, for in Bronxville with the coaches, we're going to set up an early senior night like we did for, um, for the soccer season. So that way we make sure we get them in just in case we do get shut down. For travel, it'll be the same travel that we uh, experienced in the fall. One bus, maximum amount of students will be 20 students sitting in every other seat, um, social distance with masks on. Um, that's very important for us. And the fall, we did great in the fall. You know, we didn't really get affected at all to playoffs time. So we were very excited about that. Seven day rule is new to parents. Um, the seven day rule means that in the old days, you could only practice for six days and you had to take the seventh off. Because the season's short, so short, the state has allowed seven days straight continuous um, mm -hmm. just because they're trying to get practices in as soon as possible. For conditioning purposes, Practice the, the amount of practice to stay the same. Six practices before you can play in the game. Football will be ten. Uh, maximum number of games have been reduced. Twelve for basketball. Six for seven for football. Lacrosse will say it'll be twelve. Baseball will say it'll be twelve. Um, that'll be determined as our seasons uh, start and we see how the weather affects the outdoor. State has um, already decided not to have any state championships in the spring. And our coaches are taking copious notes about who's at practice, who's not at practice, just to make sure that if there is any kind of a situation where we need to find out if a student was in school or not in school or at practice, um, the children know how many practices they have. And also too, if we have to shut down because a student was at practice or not. Great. I, I believe those are the main differences from a traditional year. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate uh, you staying on top of all that information for us. Um, I know you've only been with us for the first year, but it seems like you've been here forever covering all that stuff. So uh, we appreciate that you're on top of it for us. <clears throat> Roar, do you mind if I ask a quick question? Yeah, please, John, go ahead. So Joe, thanks, thanks for all that. That was pretty comprehensive. For a question with the, or the football and lacrosse and any other sport that maybe hockey that where the, the players are expected to wear mouthpieces for concussion risk or other safety reasons, is that 
uh, are they going to still wear a mouthpiece or is does the mask requirement, uh, you know, contradict that? Um, that was one of the biggest challenges um, that DOH had that we were doing all, all the research being taking place is because obviously wearing a mask, usually in most sports, you have a string on your mask that holds a mouthpiece in place. Um, now, either strings will be longer, but the children will have to wear a mask. Excuse me, we'll have to wear a mouthpiece for the collision sports. I mean, that's that's all about concussion and concussion management. So they will definitely not release that uh, option for the children. They will definitely be in mouthpieces. Thank you. And, and Joe, since we, we, we made it through the fall season, do we have any data, like if any kids were actually infected um, with the virus because of team sports in the fall? I mean, is there, was there any study done, let's say by section one or? Section one did it, but, but other states did. Wisconsin did a huge um, study on it. And if you notice, as parents start, as groups started politicking to get sports back, they kept coming out with more and more research that was stating that the transition, um, the opportunity to gain the virus through, from another student during a game really was limited, minimal or none. It was more during social settings when the students had it transmitted mm -hmm. rather than during the actual game time or practice time. Um, it was very interesting, especially because many of the states really took extreme measures to ensure children were not going to uh, infect one another. Um, but I do know this, that in New York State, we did not do our own study now. Or on the buses, right? Going to and from games? Correct. And, and it said, you know, obviously there is social distancing on buses. Um, uh, Jim Agnello has a, for the ski bus, he has a, he brings his own air purifier on the bus because they travel a long way. It's plugged in. I mean, so our, our coaches are really going above and beyond to ensure that the coaches are being safe, excuse me, that students are being safe as possible. And we make sure our kids are masked on the bus. I mean, you know, some kids want to drop that mask. It's more comfortable not to wear it, but we keep, we keep trying to tell the students that if you want to continue to play, you have to wear the mask. It's, it's that simple. And Joe, I'm assuming that the team dinners are gone. There's no, there has not been a team dinner yet. I know people are missing them like crazy. But they were such a tradition. Dinner. Correct. Okay. Great. Thank you, Joe. Again, appreciate all that. Uh, Arlene, uh, if you would please um, uh, entertain the motion. Yes, I would like to um, ask for a motion to approve the resolution as it is printed in the agenda, so I don't have to read it. Um, do I have a motion? Motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any further conversation, discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Great. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, and thank you, Joe, as well. Um, next thing on my agenda is just a quick first review of the draft calendar for the next school year uh, that is uh, attached as part of the meeting agenda. I would just point out to you, it's a very kind of tight calendar. There's not a lot of flexibility given our contractual demands and where the holidays fall and everything. Just some quick things to point out to you. You'll notice that the first day of school for children will be on Thursday, September 9th. Uh, uh, Labor Day is September 6th. Then we have the Rosh Hashanah holiday on the 7th and 8th. So the first day for kids is actually the 9th, which is a pretty late start, actually, um, which, again, maybe in this COVID era, it'll help a little bit, uh, pushing things further down the line. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, you notice that there is a shorter uh, winter break around Christmas and New Year's. It's only a 10-day break, not a 14, two-week window like we had this year. Um, and then we did uh, have to add the uh, new state holiday of Juneteenth, which is on June 20th this year. June 19th has been designated Juneteenth. And to my understanding that if it falls on a uh, Saturday, you don't have to have it in your calendar Sunday, you do have to celebrate on a Monday. So that added to the complexity, a little bit of the calendar uh, for next year, but it's on for a first review today and then next board meeting will approve it. So if anybody has a question about it. When's uh, Easter Sunday? I, I guess I could look, but it, it yeah. is. Um, I believe it's the seventeenth. Yeah, seventeenth or tenth. Seventeenth. Week. So the okay. April break is the week before Easter. Yeah, so it includes Good Friday. We save the day that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's that. Um, 
And the last part uh, that is under my report, I am going to introduce uh, Mara Ketke to, to uh, do a review of the assessment update of where we are this year. It's not a full assessment report as we've done, you know, with everything at the end of the year, but um, just kind of wanted to give a, an idea of where we are, what we're looking at, and where the student, more, more importantly, where the student performance and growth is. So Mara, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Roy. Thanks, Arlene. Uh, you know, as a team, we've been thinking a lot about where we have been from last March until now, almost a full year. Uh, as everyone knows, we began learning remotely. Uh, we returned to school in the fall with new and innovative ways to keep us safe, including plexiglass and temperature checks. Our high school has been in a hybrid model of learning with some students learning from home and some students come in. And of course, throughout the year, we've had the occasional need to return to remote learning due to an increase in cases. So tonight we're gonna to talk about some quantitative as well as qualitative data on what we have learned so far and where we stand in terms of student achievement. So I'm gonna begin by sharing a quote uh, from a senior who, who I spoke to with regard to the senior is learning fully remotely. Uh, and she talked with me about when the course is easy for me, remote learning is really great. Uh, it gives her an opportunity to go further and explore the content of the course in, in you know, more interesting and independent ways. Uh, when the class is difficult for me, learning remotely is more of a challenge. And this is particularly true when hands-on experiences are important as with physics. And I think she brings up some themes that will present themselves through the data that we're gonna look at tonight. Thinking back to June, I think we were most concerned about our growth in reading levels for our youngest students, and that includes our kindergarten to third grade students. Uh, third grade is, is about the time where the transition from learning to read to reading to learn occurs. Teaching reading and phonics, which often uses manipulatives and takes a multi-sensory approach, to young students in kindergarten and first grade uh, can be challenging. So we were worried, you know, a little bit in terms of reading growth for our youngest and most vulnerable readers. Uh, reading progress appeared stable in grades four through eight. So tonight we're going to talk about one uh, type of assessment. It is the STAR assessment. We give it to every student in kindergarten and eighth through eighth grade three times a year, generally in October, around January, and again in June. Uh, we, of course, have other data. We do TC running records for our elementary school students. There are obviously in-class assessments. Uh, but the STAR assessment is a good thing to look at because it's particularly good at predicting how students would fare on a New York State uh, ELA or math exam. Uh, and the STAR addresses levels of proficiency would which would equate to earning a level three or four on a New York State exam. Um, the exam is adaptive. So as a, an individual student answers more questions correctly, it gets harder. Uh, it is more difficult to be proficient in October, let's say, than in January. Uh, and this is very new and fresh data. Uh, we have yet to have some discussions with our teachers over this information. Uh, we actually have approximately 30 students in our middle school who are still needing uh, makeup exams. But this is sort of where we are at this particular point in time. I've also included New York State ELA data, which the ELA is typically given in April. So you can get a sense as compared to 2019, sort of where we did historically on the ELA and how our students did in October and in January uh, as compared to how we've done historically. 
So looking at this slide, you know, we can see the kindergarten through fifth grade uh, students. We are very pleased with how well the kindergarten first and second grade uh, students are doing in their reading. As you can see, our second grade is making some growth. Um, we have, you know, mixed results in third, fourth, and fifth grade. Um, but again, we're not overly concerned about a loss of one percentage point in terms of students who are proficient at this point. And given where we are in January, we think it is likely that we will close more gaps to get to where we are, were historically in terms of achievement in ELA uh, by the end of the year. Moving on to middle school, we're looking at the same information, how students, the percentage of students considered proficient in October and again in January compared to the New York State ELA, which was given in April of 2019. And what we see here is students coming in, you know, prepared. Uh, we see some increases uh, in at least grades six and seven. But in line where we, where we are have been historically, and in some cases, slightly better. So if we look at this information, we can you know, deduce that in terms of reading, our kids are maintaining and doing well. So as I'm sure you're aware, in three grades, kindergarten through eighth, we do have a full section of remote learners. That would be in grade three, in grade five, and in grade six. So what we're looking at on this particular side, slide is the percentage of students proficient in October in the remote section, uh, and the percentage of students proficient in January in the remote section compared to where we have done historically. And then you are also looking at the combined in-person uh, classes in terms of percentage of students proficient in October and in January. So what this tells us is the remote learners are doing quite well. You know, they are uh, in some cases making progress uh, or, and or staying the same. Uh, closing gaps through where we have been historically at this time, uh, and that is good information. I think it's important to know that there are smaller sample sizes in the remote only sections. And if you look at the demographics of the students, we have more independent learners in our remote section who require less support and more students with IEPs and 504s intermingled uh, across the in-person classes. Uh, and they you know, are getting that support in school, which is also wonderful for them. Hey, Mara. Yep. For the, for the um, 2019 data, is that, like, let's pick the grade five remote where the, you know, they're at 100%. Are those the same kids showing up at 67 two years ago? Or like, what, what cohort are you comparing them to? So the 67 represents the fifth graders who took that in 2019. So that would be current seventh graders. I see. So not when this fifth grade was in third grade. So this is okay. No, I'm just, comparing, I'm just comparing them to what we have historically done in that particular grade level. This is not a cohort comparison. Thanks. So moving forward to math, I think in June, we were more concerned about math in grades four through eight, less concerned about math in grades K through three. Um, the reasoning behind that is the concepts become more sophisticated in math in grades five through seven. This includes operations uh, with fractions, decimals, and percents ratios, equations, and expressions, including translating word problems into equations, order of operation, geometry, including area circumference, and supplementary and complementary ang uh, angles. There is also a cumulative nature of mathematics um, that is more present uh, than other disciplines. 
Um, we are experiencing a loss of some of the hands-on manipulative work that we typically do in our math classes. We move from the concrete pictorial to the abstract. And so all these you know, are concerns, concerns we had in June and looking forward to the data to see where we are. So again, same, you know, comparison. We are, kindergartners do not take a star assessment in math, just so you're aware. Uh, first through fifth grade is represented here. And again, the orange bars represent what we have done historically in that particular grade in, in 2019. Just to put those numbers in context, they are not a cohort uh, to cohort comparison. Um, but as we see, the first graders are faring well along with the second and third graders. In the fourth and the fifth grade, we do begin to see some gaps. Um, we are making some progress in some cases, but in terms of what we have historically done in those grades, uh, we begin to see some gaps. That actually continues a bit in middle school. Um, as you can see here, in particular, our seventh grade came in at the 63% of the students being proficient in October, 68% being proficient in January, which is some growth. But again, in terms of what we have historically done in grade seven, uh, we have some gaps we need to close. Um, so I am aware that there were some technical difficulties when the seventh graders took the STAR exam. I cannot ensure that that had anything to do with these numbers. Uh, but again, you know, we are looking to close those gaps. We will be talking with teachers about why we think this is. Um, we'll have to see where we end up. We've had discussions about giving this exam again in April to see where we are and in June. And we may in fact need to devote some time in September next year to review uh, if that's necessary. Uh, movement towards proficiency is often messy and unpredictable, but this is good information for us, you know, in terms of benchmarking where we are now. So as you, as you said, Mara, I just want to make sure I was clear on your messaging that, that, that this is hot off the press. It is hot off and the so, press. <laughs> okay, so, so it, it's impossible to come up with solutions right now. So your next step is to meet with the teachers to get their insights, their experience, um, and then you will develop a plan for course correction. That's right. What, and we'll, whatever, okay. Yes, and we're gonna compare some of these results to you know um, in-school assessments that align with the units of study. So I think that's okay. an important discussion to have as well. Okay. Had there been any indications, like were you hearing from teachers that they thought they were the students might be falling behind? Was there a general concern? You know, I I will say that I think there is always a general concern in math, uh, okay. particularly because of the cumulative nature of mathematics. Right. If they don't master the prior grade standards, they will not have the skills in place to build upon that. So I think that's something Anne, Tom, Tricia, and I have always heard in terms of a concern. Um, but now we're actually, you know, really being able to see where the kids started and what growth has been made thus far and where we need to focus our efforts. Okay, thank um, you. Sure, this slide, you know, I hope will be a little reassuring in terms of mathematics. So this is uh, focused on grades four through eight. And what this talks about is the percent of students at or above typical growth. So what this is showing is that in fourth grade, 55% of fifth graders are at or above typical growth needed to reach proficiency by June. Uh, likewise, in fifth grade, 62% of sixth graders are at or above typical growth needed to reach proficiency by uh, June. And in seventh grade, we've got 70% of seventh graders at or above typical growth to reach proficiency by June. So, you know, this is, I think, good information to say that some of those students are making growth and, and it's possible that by April or June, we could close these gaps. 
Obviously, uh, we will be thinking about the 30 to 45% of students who are not making growth and thinking about where the students end up in our curriculum. So this is just a little information to enlighten some of the math scores in terms of growth. And we are seeing growth uh, provided that we do have some things we need to discuss as a team and gaps we need to look at. Um, likewise, in terms of math, you can see here the comparisons in terms of October and June of students, percentage of students proficient in the remote sections in grade three, five, and six, as compared to the combined in-person students in those grades. Um, you know, again, I mean, you do see a little slip in remote learning in math among the remote sections, not significant, but in general, you know, we have to look at math, particularly in grades four through eight, and make some decisions and do some additional analysis in terms of how the star compares to what teachers are seeing in classrooms. So moving to high school, you know, we don't have a ton of data at this point, but I did want to share that for the ACT, there were 56 students who took the ACT this fall. Um, and as you can see here, the composite score is actually slightly higher than it was in 2018 and 19. And this, the subtest scores look pretty well in line with what we have done historically. Uh, SAT similar, we had 65 test takers this fall and our averages in reading and writing and math as well as our totals have lined up with where we have been in the prior two years. So I think that's good information as well. Um, moving to some more you know, qualitative information we had uh, a mid-year debrief, which was facilitated in our high school. It included both uh, students and teachers. It was facilitated by N. Rusk, which was formerly known as Not Notosh, who ha we have worked with before, uh, in, a in an attempt to reflect on what we have learned and what we want to take forward into our future. So what you're looking at is a wordle and the, the words that are larger uh, came up the most in the course of the conversation that we had with teachers and students in the high school. And as you can see, you know, the importance of innovation, culture, community, resilience, change, and hope were all uh, themes represented in those discussions. To dig a little deeper and, you know, hopefully we'll get an opportunity to present the full uh, scope of this mid-year debrief conversation because it was very powerful. But just to share a little bit here, uh, in terms of students' skills and practices, um, you know, teacher, a teacher commented that students have learned autonomy and to work independently, and they may have gotten or many have gotten stronger and mm -hmm. more mature. A theme among students was that remote learning taught me time management. Uh, being able to connect with teachers and friends was hard. Uh, you have to really work to connect with your teachers, which is not necessarily a bad thing to learn if you're headed off to college. Um, not knowing what is important is hard. And there was a lot of expressions of vulnerability, um, you know, feeling vulnerable both among teachers and students. Uh, and, you know, just this idea that sometimes it's harder to contribute over Zoom because you run the risk of being misinterpreted, which is um, sometimes more difficult to correct over Zoom than it is in, per in person. Innovation was, of course, a major theme. Um, you know, one teacher commented that the mediums of learning that we are using are causing us to redevelop curriculum with new tools. We are innovating. You know, the innovation has been the big story of this time period. We have really gone leaps and bounds in terms of what we thought our capacity was and what we actually were able to do. 
Um, many people feel that our ability to adapt quickly speaks to the strength of our school. Teacher perfectionism, which is a real thing and offers, often stands in the way of educational innovation, had to be let go, uh, which allowed us to be a little more uh, likely to lean into innovation due, out of necessity. Um, a few people mentioned the changing role of the teacher and the power of the flipped classroom. You know, a few years ago when we would talk mm -hmm. about flipped flip cl classroom and Brad can attest to this, we didn't get a lot of interest. <laughs> but now <laughs> I think, you know, due to what we have lived through, the flipped classroom is deemed as a superior way to learn and can really help to use class time differently. Um, we have some people who wanna do 100% digital curriculum. There seem to be some uh, feeling positive about blended formats, including learning asynchronously at times and then in person in time as we move forward. Um, and, you know, there was an expressed opinion that it's difficult in the hybrid model. I think teachers are comfortable teaching students asynchronously and enjoy the interaction with in, in person with students to support that asynchronous work. But it's hard when you have a third of your kids on the screen and two thirds of your students with you. Uh, it definitely presents a challenge. Lastly, you know, we've experienced a lot of change in assessment. As you know, we gave our midterms uh, fully remotely. Um, one teacher commented that assessment has changed and the old ways are obsolete. There was talk about a secure platform being stressful but helpful once understood. Um, uploading written work into a test given digitally seemed to be positive. People are interested in taking new models of assessment forward. Uh, the changing in testing strategies that include more open notes and applications have been, and application based questions have been interesting uh, and, you know, food for thought as we continue to grow and hopefully, you know, turn the corner on some of this. And then lastly, I just wanted to share in light of uh, assessment, the discussion on assessment. This is a video taken from students in Kevin Guidel's class. This is AP Physics One. It is a Fabuche project where students had to apply their knowledge of forces, energy, transfer, and motion. And I think it's a pretty cool way to show how we've been thinking differently about assessment. So I'm just gonna show it briefly. So that was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think the soundtrack really, really helped it. Exactly. So, so Mara, this is fabulous. This was really, really very helpful. How do you expect to kind of, I'm gonna use the word capsulate, but bring it all together to come up with your lessons learned to influence learning going forward? You know, I think we want to we want to focus on the data we have now. Uh, we want to think about how we can use the rest of the time this year most wisely. Um, but you know, I my feeling at this point is that in in terms of encapsulating what we've learned, we have come so far in terms of thinking differently about what we do, and you know, kind of boundaries that used to exist, at least in our mind, we have conquered. 
-hmm. And I, I mm -hmm. do believe there is a feeling among the teachers, you know, this has been a challenging time without question and all credit is due to them. Uh, but I do think there is a feeling that people want to, we don't just want to get past this experience. I mean, in some ways we do, but we want to learn from it and take it into our practice as we move, you know, forward to a time where this will not be necessary. Uh, and I do believe there is a lot of feeling out there that lessons have been learned that can help us do our jobs better when we don't have to do it this way. So right. I'm waiting, you know, until we can land on what exactly those things are. I think the mid-year discussion um, pointed to some possibilities there in terms of what teachers and kids found most valuable, and there were some things. So I think, you know, building on that and continuing to watch our data um, and will be an important part going forward into the spring and certainly, you know, into the summer and the fall as we continue to take what we've learned and put it to best use for our future. And, and I hope I'm not being too bold, but there's a part of me that would love to see a, a, a digital report or something, you know, in the August, September time period that we could say to not only to the school, to the board, to the community, this is what we learned. We took lemons, we made lemonade. This is what we learned and this is how it's gonna impact us going forward. Cause you have done such a fabulous job of making this all work. And, and to be able to now say, we're not gonna to return to the old. We're gonna learn from what we've gone through and we're gonna make it all better. That's the championship game, that's it. Well, I like to be in the championship game. So <laughs> we certainly <laughs> have, we certainly have the data and I think that is very doable. I think it's important for us to solidify our lessons learned and let the community know what pieces of this we wanna take forward to the benefit of all our kids. Perfect. I don't, I, I don't think you should feel, I don't think that anybody doing this, you, the teachers should feel that you have to answer all of those lessons learned at once. It may be something where some of them emerge and then as you think further, some more emerge. Yeah, Is it's that, likely to take time to process this whole experience as well. Right. Yeah, and part of it is just gonna be to recover from the year. Yeah. But it, I don't, I mean, if there are some initial thoughts um, we shouldn't wait until they're all put together. Um, if there's some good ideas that come out, we can take a look at those and then you can continue the process of reflecting and putting together the best ideas. Yeah. I wanna see you published, by the way. <laughs> I think Let me write that down. Thing. <laughs> Would you write that down? Must be published. <laughs> Must be published. <laughs> okay. Other, other board members have any comments? There are a lot of school districts that are jealous that we're just, that we're in session. Yeah. True, true, true. true. We're very fortunate. Yeah. All right, Arlene, good. Moving forward. All right, thank you, Mara. Well done, or should I say Tom Brady in this case? Well done. No. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> Pick a stealer. <laughs> okay, um, thank you again, well done. And thank you to all the uh, administrative team that lent itself to this whole presentation and works at it every day. We're, uh, we're very blessed to have such a strong administrative team, so I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm done with our, our, my report. So Arlene, I'll turn it back over to you and you can turn it over to Rachel, I think. Right, to Rachel, you're on. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I have the bittersweet pleasure of talking about um, eight teachers and one teaching assistant who have submitted their resignation for the purpose of retirement. And the principals and I did not want this opportunity um, to go by without just saying a, a few brief words about them. 
Um, they, they represent, Arlene, I think you mentioned this, they represent over 200 years um, of, of work in our school. And um, although we will have plenty of time to celebrate them further, I did wanna take a moment um, again on behalf of the principals and I, and, and just say a few brief words. Uh, so in alphabetical order, Pat Allen is completing 26 years of dedicated service as a speech language pathologist in the Bronxville School. Her caseload has primarily consisted of our special class students. Pat has successfully taught our students how to communicate more effectively. She prides herself on establishing close working relationships with the students and families she serves. So many special education students have benefited from her expertise over the past two and a half decades. Diane Aronson has been at the Bronxville School for the past 31 years. During that time, she has used her passion for education to help her primary grade students succeed academically, socially, and emotionally. Diane has also shared her love of the arts with the elementary school through her leadership with the lecture series and the elementary play throughout her many years in Bronxville. Liz Fleisick has been a part of the Bronxville middle, middle School for nearly two and a half decades. She is known to her current students as primarily a teacher of social studies, but for many years, she was also a math teacher on the grade level as well. Liz has been a welcoming and positive part of making the transition from elementary to middle school for so many students over the years. Denise Luter has been an integral part of the Bronxville School for the last 36 years. She's a passionate educator whose work with her students has produced extraordinary results. She is not only a dedicated teacher, she has provided leadership and professional development for the district as our teacher center coordinator, helping teachers develop their crafts and skills throughout their careers. Denise has never stopped pursuing her own development traveling throughout the country and world over many summers to participate in various opportunities in order to bring new knowledge back to her students and colleagues. Anne-Marie Mazio has been a special educator in Bronxville for 18 years, having taught for 13 years prior to her arrival here. Anne-Marie has been an integral part of the middle school special education department, working closely with both her general education and special education colleagues. Anne-Marie stepped up in a big way this year to help cover one of her colleagues' caseload by taking on our littlest of Broncos who needed support in reading, writing, and math. This is a testament to her versatility and, adaptabil and adaptability, which we have observed throughout her tenure. Maria Pizzolato has served as a special education teacher at the elementary school for the past 20 years after teaching at Winward for 20 years. Her her expertise in learning differences has helped many students build confidence and reach their personal goals. Maria's ability to target individual student needs in reading, writing, and math has helped to strengthen the elementary school special education department. David Ryan has spent the last 32 years at Bronxville sharing with students his love of chemistry and physics. Every year, even every semester, Dave reinvents the curriculum to provide students with hands-on engaging ways to discover the fundamental aspects of our universe. He has also served as a dedicated coach to our track athletes. Both in the classroom and on the field, his care and compassion for our students and his knowledge and expertise in the physical sciences have benefited our students. And Tom Sanders, not only does he exhibit outstanding service in the classroom, he has also coached our students in a variety of sports over the years. He is finishing his 20th year of teaching in Bronxville. The generations of students who have developed civic understanding and pride in democracy under his expert care have been given a gift by having shared time with Tom. And our teaching assistant, Ellie Boyam, has been with us for 16 years in one of our special classes. Her care and concern for our students is readily apparent. She builds strong relationships with students and her colleagues. Ellie is always ready to support the students in her classroom in any way she can. She collaborates beautifully with the classroom staff as well as with the related service providers. Our special class students have benefited greatly over the years 
from Ellie's creativity, passion, and love. So with that, I would like the board to consider the resolution to approve their resignations for the purpose of retirement, the eight teachers, A through H, as well as our teaching assistant, Ellie, I. Thank you, Rachel. I mean, these are household names. So really, it is bittersweet. Well said, well said. And thank you for sharing those little bits of nuggets about each one of them. So may I have a motion for A through I? So moved. Second. Jack. Second. Oh. Jack and Mike. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Rachel. Back to you to finish the list. Thank you. And then I would like you to consider, um, we have uh, two short-term short overages um, where uh, two teachers were covering a colleague who was out um, uh, on medical leave, as well as a teacher aide, which had been budgeted for, a substitute nurse. And then we have two coaching rosters before you this evening, fall two, uh, for, and that covers football and girls swimming, as well as a revision to the winter coaching roster to now include basketball and ice hockey. So that would be items J through O, please. May I have a motion? I move. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Great, thanks everybody. And thank you again, Rachel. Mr. Carlin. Yes, thank you. Um, the board is in receipt of the preliminary financial summary for the month of, month of December, uh, which is quite different from the November one. And the, uh, the big difference is we're no longer projecting a deficit in our state aid because word came down from on high that our aid would be restored for the current fiscal year, uh, which is good news. Uh, now we're starting to project like uh, any normal year. Uh, we're now starting to see uh, some surpluses in some certain expenditure areas. We're still dealing with an interest income shortfall, but it's uh, far less of a problem now. Um, you know, we're, we're getting closer to covering the uh, $500,000 allocation uh, to offset the tax levy in 2021-22 that's in the budget draft. And we'll definitely get there and beyond that at some point. Uh, I would look for the, this uh, net surplus number to edge higher throughout the rest of the year. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the, the panic that was in, in, uh, <clears throat> in my mind, at least over the summer, uh, has been alleviated somewhat, um, which is good news. I'd be happy Very to answer goodness. any questions regarding uh, this summary. So Dan, if my memory's correct, you had talked about doing some cuts starting the 1st of January and February. What's it's, your thinking it, on that now? Yeah, we didn't do, we, we didn't do cuts. We just put a, um, a hold on purchase hold. orders. Yeah. So we, we, might, we might, might loosen up the faucet a little bit. Okay. And certainly, was a any, word. certainly anybody who needs anything will get what they need. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, looking towards uh, next year, uh, I'm going to share my screen. I have a couple of slides uh, because we have some new information. Uh, let's see if I can find the right one to share. Uh, we have some new information coming out uh, in the last week uh, and uh, this week as of a couple of days ago also which impact the budget um, uh, from where we left off on our uh, Saturday workshop a couple of weeks ago. 
the uh, the 2021-22 budget process is kind of rounding the corner towards the home stretch. Uh, but this year, particularly, we have a lot of work to do. I think the last couple of years, we were pretty much done by this point. But we are not done yet. Our proposed budget sits at about $51.4 million, uh, which is a tax levy increase of 4.17%. Uh, versus a calculated uh, cap of 1.7%. So we're over by over a million dollars. And that's where we left off. Uh, Dan, your sport's not moving, Dan. Dan the What's that? Not moving for us. I'm not sure if you're showing us different slides or just. That's interesting. No backspace. It, uh, these slides are not moving for you? No, it's not in presentation mode at all. It might be split screen presentation mode. Right. Um, you can just present from this if you want to close the always use. Sure. Tools. Yeah. Just... If you can just see that slide, that's fine. That's where we are, about a million, uh, million one over the cap. Uh, here's the new information. Um, we need we need to get about two point two and a half percent out of our budget. Uh, just to hit the cap. And we have a little bit of a head start after some news we got this week. We got the final teacher retirement system rate. We I had originally budgeted 10% because they gave us a range of uh, nine and a half to 10%. It came in at 9.8%. So we're able to save $47,000 there. And then, uh, you know, we got eight retirements with the retirement incentive, although we're losing a lot of human capital uh, we are we expect to save uh, some green capital, which would be about three hundred and forty thousand dollars or so. Uh, so that combines to you know upwards of uh, almost four hundred thousand dollars, which is uh, almost a, a percentage point out of that two two and a half percent gap. So we're looking at about a one point six percent gap or six hundred and eighty eight thousand dollars. And the board has uh, asked us uh, to come prepared uh, at the uh, Saturday workshop. Uh, I think it's on March 6th to, uh, to come uh, hopefully with some final plans and dealing with that, which we intend to do. But it's a lot less of a problem than it was uh, uh, at the last Saturday workshop, which is good news. Yeah, that's great news passage of time is giving us some clarity in a very murky, murky situation. Okay, any questions for Dan at this time from the board members? Okay, Dan, I think you have one more piece or two more pieces of information to share with us. About the donations. Dan, are you on mute by any chance? Where did Dan go? <laughs> Where did Dan go? He's not on my screen. Dan has left the building. Dan has left. I didn't even see his mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> and that puts us in a challenge for the next one as well. Okay. Um, well, let's say before he gets on. Um, the resolutions are on the um, yeah. on the agenda. If we want to pursue those, is Roy? I, I, I hate to put you on the spot. Do you have the background of these two? I wish I could tell you uh, more of the background, uh, but they they went right to Dan on this one. So yeah, I know there were donations. Um, the, They're the, on the agenda. They're listed on the agenda. agenda. I just don't know the origin of them. To be honest with yeah. you, yeah. Okay, and they are, I do not recall seeing um, donation or, um, donations like this in the past. So that's why I was hoping we could get some background from, from Dan. Alina, I think um, we get the Exxon, get one. We get the Exxon one every year, I think. Do yeah. we really? Okay. Yeah, I think I remember the Exxon one in prior years. Okay. The other one I don't recognize. But the other one is for uh, a kitchen that was, I guess, either donated or given or somebody took it that was yeah, it sounded like a one-off type of yeah something was damaged 
Yeah, so it was like a kitchen stove or something? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's unique for sure. Cafeteria oven, but I you know yeah. why it got damaged. So his computer needs to be rebooted if you want to wait on those two resolutions until he comes back in and we can I I think that would be best. And for the next up we have the facilities action items and and maybe Roy and Jen, I believe you might be able to fill in the holes on the facilities updates. So I can do the update. That's that's easy enough for me to do. Okay. Uh, just to give everybody a sense of where we are, um, we are actually in the home stretch of the uh, of the large capital project. Uh, most of the punch list items of, of the work have been done. The two outstanding ones are the guidance suite and the atrium <clears throat> guidance suite. Um, as I've been mentioning at the council meetings as well, um, they're beginning to lay the floor down. Um, they are. The, well, that's one of the last steps. I got to finish the lights. Um, they have the panels, the glass panel be, uh, into the hallway where the uh, new uh, stairwell is, is, has gone in. Uh, so we expect that to be turned over, I think, shortly after the break, which will allow us to move the uh, high school guidance office down into the new suite and turn the uh, current guidance office and in, back into a classroom uh, for which it was originally. Um, I think approximately two weeks after that, I was been told the atrium should be, be online um, as they're starting to do some of the finishing work in the inside um, there. So I would expect, I'm hoping by March, early March, that we get the atrium, which uh, opens up some large spaces, allows us to, to gain another classroom on the third floor. We can move some things around and uh, as I said earlier, allows us to use the learning commons for the original purpose that we designed it for. So um, that's coinciding with us having the ability of uh, having high school kids back in full time. So we're um, moving along quite well. Uh, we did uh, ask Lan recently to prepare a bid spec, uh, a single uh, bid spec for the uh, for the gymnasium, the the beam that goes across the gymnasium. Um, we did get some prices from our current contractors that we were not thrilled with, and it'll be, I think we'll get better pricing if we send it out for a separate bid. Lan agreed with that, so that should be out shortly. Um, it wouldn't be done until most likely June or July anyway, um, so we think that's the best course of action. Um, that's currently where we did uh, also part of the meeting we had with Lan is just kind of going over future potential projects in the district. But we'll get we can get more into detail on that another time. There's nothing urgent on that. Okay. Uh, okay. So gives you a quick update. Perfect. Thanks for stepping um, in, Roy. Oh, <laughs> uh, there he is. The donations, Dan, because there was the donations were all yours. Technical yeah, the, the, technical uh, difficulties, but uh, I am back with now now with my uh, battery charger plug plugged in. Uh, <laughs> let's see. We do have two donations. One that we seem to get every year from a local service station that uh, is required to uh, to donate money to the schools every year. So we're very thankful to them uh, for their donation to our, uh, I think it's our math and science program from the ExxonMobil Educational Alliance program. And the other one is we had a uh, broken oven that we were actually going to toss because it costs more money for us to fix it. However, uh, the company that fixes the oven uh, thought they would take it off our hands for a donation of about a thousand dollars. So that's, uh, we'll, we'll take that. It's kind of like when uh, your trade in's not worth much, but somebody will take it off your hands. <laughs> Well, that sounds like a, 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 a green way to go forward as well, then. Exactly. So, so they can probably fix it a lot cheaper and use it. So okay. uh, I'd ask that the board accept these two donations. Okay. May I have a motion to accept A and B? Jack. Jack, Jack and Tom. Okay. Great. Thank you. All, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. So, Dan, you want to jump to action item eight on the yeah, capital there's reserve no facilities fund? action items and we have one more other action item which is uh re-upping on our construction reserve fund for another 10 years 
the initial 10 year period uh, for the fund, which has to be set up with a uh, kind of an expiration date uh, is ending. Uh, we have about a million dollars in the fund at the moment. We want to uh, keep it for another 10 years uh, with, under the same terms. And that's uh, with a limit of $10 million and currently limited at uh, $1 million a year that we can put into it. And I'm told by council that the expiration date and the limits, some limits have to be included. So okay. I think it worked fine for us for 10 years so I think uh, we used it for the uh, auditorium project mm -hmm. uh, and we used it for the uh, current uh, project that we're, we're just finishing up now. Um, I think future plans for it will be kind of use it as a sinking fund to replace at least one of the two fields uh, over a period of time because they're both gonna come due pretty much at the same time. They're only a year right. apart. Um, and, uh, and, and other uses for maintenance over the course of the next 10 years. So I think it would behoove us to extend that. Okay, thank you, Dan. May I have a motion from the board to approve the resolution that's included in our materials? Move. Second. And a second. Okay, any discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. So moving to section nine on board reports, um, have there been any committee reports or committee meetings since our last time together? Finance, Mike? No. Anything? No. no? Okay. Facilities, I know is meeting. Yeah, uh, I think Roy gave our update. Got your update? Okay, and I think audit has not met. So um, thank you guys for your leadership in that area. Um, we. Our next time we're together is March 6th on Saturday morning for our budget workshop. And we look forward to hearing from the administration on that and having a closed budget. And with that, any, Connie, do we have any questions in the queue? There are no questions in the queue. Okay. Hearing no questions, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Jen? Jen. Okay, yeah. Jen and, and Tom, I think. Great. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Really Have a great time. Thanks. Enjoy okay. the week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.